Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome you all to the Institute. Good to see so many of you here. I'm going to be a little bit uncon unconventional by starting off by introducing myself, because I think I'm really the only person who needs an introduction to the real to know me. Um, you'll see that I'm Willie Robinson, but who is Willie Robinson? The answer is I'm the Sir William Dale Visiting Fellow for this year. Um, I am here to conduct a research project in the quality of European legislation, EU legislation. Um, I have more details of it here for those who are interested. I won't bore you with it now because we have more important maths in members. But for those who are interested, here is a, a sheet setting out details of my project, and I'll be pleased to talk to anybody who is interested afterwards. But now, if we can start straight away with the main business of the evening. So it's a great honour for me to welcome you all to the 10th Sir William Day of Memorial Lecture. Many of you here knew Sir William Dale and are aware of the major contribution that he made to legal learning. But for those who do not know him and are not familiar with his work, let me just give you a very brief introduction. After beginning his career in private legal practice, William Dale joined the Colonial Office in 1935. And apart from stints at the Ministry of Supply during the war and later as legal advisor to the Ministry of Education, he devoted much of the rest of his life to providing advice to the countries and territories gaining independence, in particular countries such as Libya, Sarawak, the territory of Sarawak, and the countries of Central Africa. He was also very concerned at developing legal education. In 1964, he initiated the Government Legal Advisors course to provide training in legislation and international law for lawyers from newly independent countries. He was later its director for over 20 years. And clarity and simplicity in drafting were two of his chief concerns. In 1965, his work was recognized by a knighthood. In 1997, Sir William became the first director of the Center for Legislative Studies that now bears his name at the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies. And we're very privileged to have with us tonight Lady Dale, uh, Sir William Dale's widow, who is pleased, I think, to attend these lectures in his honour. These lectures are annual events, and they explore issues related to legislative drafting. And to give them, we invite eminent speakers from the United Kingdom and beyond. And tonight, we're going quite a long way away. For the 10th lecture in the series, we are fortunate to welcome Professor Margaret Wilson, who has long been a most distinguished academic and a leading politician in New Zealand. Professor Wilson established the University of Waikato School of Law in 1990, becoming its first professor of law and founding dean. In 1999, she became a member of parliament and was elected to cabinet where her portfolios included those of <coughs> Attorney General, Minister of Labour, Minister of Commerce, Minister in Charge of Treaty of Waitangi Negotiations, Associate Minister for Courts, and Associate Minister for Justice. A lot of responsibilities in her time. And then for three years, she was Speaker of the House of Representatives. But in 2009, she resumed her academic career as Professor of Law and Public Policy at the Waikato University Law School. And in the same year, she was awarded the Distinguished Companion of New Zealand Order of Merit. In October last year, she took up the inaugural Link Visiting Fellowship, Professorship to the United Kingdom, a three-month visiting professorship sponsored by the New Zealand United Kingdom Link Foundation. Professor Wilson is going to speak tonight on gender-neutral law drafting, the challenge of translating policy into legislation. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction and may I also acknowledge the presence of Lady Dale here this evening because I want to start with a very sincere thank you for the invitation to deliver this important memorial lecture. I do regard it <coughs> as an honour and a privilege. As a long time supporter and advocate of plain English drafting, I have been aware of Sir William's work and that of the Centre and 
course, the institute within which it's seated. I learned, however, that you need a long-term perspective as a plain English advocate. I recall in my first job as a law clerk in Auckland in the early 1970s, when being asked to draft a will, I attempted a plain English version as I'd been taught in the law school. I was quickly informed that such practices were unacceptable because it would create uncertainty and confusion. <coughs> I must say it was not the last time I was informed plain speaking and writing was unacceptable because people may understand what you're saying. <laughs> My advocacy of plain English drafting, however, stems from the commitment to the rule of law as a fundamental principle of New Zealand's constitutional arrangements. And my comments tonight, I'm afraid, will be focused on the New Zealand experience because it's that which I know most about. I must admit, however, that a commitment to the rule of law in the New Zealand context cannot be assumed, as one of our noted constitutional writers, Matthew Palmer, has written, when he argued that while the rule of law, supported of course by judicial independence, should be a cornerstone of New Zealand's constitution, he was not confident, and I quote him, that New Zealanders currently understand the rule of law, or in a crunch would necessarily stand by it as a fundamental constitutional norm. However, if the law is not accessible to the people, then it's difficult to expect them to understand the important role it plays in the maintenance of a society <coughs> that is not only peaceful and orderly, but also protects every citizen's human rights. Amongst the essential elements of accessibility of the law, however, of course, is clarity of language and ease of purchase of legislation. And as Sir William wrote, in his seminal book, Legislative Drafting, The New Approach, men and women should be encouraged to read and know the laws and to buy the official print of a statute, which is, after all, the most direct and cheapest way of acquiring knowledge of its contents. I'm pleased to report that in New Zealand, all statutes are now freely available electronically, and I'm sure Sir William would have approved. Although I personally have no skill really in, in legal drafting. I have been fortunate in the past to contribute a little to the cause of plain English advocates. In the late 1980s, I was a member of the New Zealand Law Commission that undertook research and work that eventually resulted in major reforms in legal drafting practice, including gender neutral drafting, also a new Acts Interpretation Act and most recently, a legislation bill that is currently before the New Zealand Parliament. These reforms that were started in the 80s were the result of a term of reference given to the Commission by the then Minister of Justice, Geoffrey Palmer, who had a real and genuine interest and commitment to improving accessibility of the law to all. He understood the need for fundamental rethinking, however, of not only drafting practices, but also the delivery of legislation in an accessible form. His intention was clearly stated in the terms of reference we received. In the plain language, it said, first, the purpose of the review was stated simply as to propose ways of making legislation as understandable and accessible as practicable, and to keep it under review in a systematic way. He then went on in the terms of reference, which I know he wrote himself, directing us to explicitly examine and review the language and structure of legislation, the arrangements for the systematic monitoring and review of it, then <coughs> the law relating to legislation, and the review also required that the provisions of the then Acts Interpretation Act of 1924 and other related legislation also be reviewed. During the period of the late 80s and 1990s, the Commission <coughs> produced four quite important reports. And those reports resulted in significant changes not only in drafting practice, 
but also in a new X Interpretation Act that was eventually enacted in 1999. I think the best way to describe the reports and their underlying approach is to quote from one of the most important reports, which was the legislation manual structure and style. And it stated in these terms what was required. It said, there is no mystery to plain language. Plain language is ordinary language, expressed directly and clearly. It's intended to simplify to the extent possible, but not be simplistic, to enhance style rather than be stylistically bland. In legislation, its use is intended to remove the barriers to communication and in this way make the law more accessible. The report then went on to identify those barriers to communication as being an absence of underlying principle, poor organisation of legislation, long convoluted sentences, unnecessary arcane and archaic language, excessive internal reference and unnecessary repetitive wording. These recommendations were eventually incorporated in the new Acts Interpretation Act, the purpose of which was provided as being, one, to state principles and rules of interpretation of legislation, two, to shorten legislation, and three, to promote consistency in the language and form of legislation. It then went on, the New Acts Interpretation Act, to provide the principles for interpretation in the following terms. The meaning of an enactment must be ascertained from the text and in the light of that purpose. It then went on in the Act to say the sort of matters that could be considered, including the preamble, the analysis, table of contents and explanatory material were all described in the legislation as being permissible. Perhaps, however, more important than the actual act itself, from my perspective anyway, was the changes in the legislative drafting practices, including the format and style, which took place from the late 1990s onwards. Gender-neutral drafting was part of this new approach to drafting. The new plain English approach was formally acknowledged in the statutory sense in the Acts and Regulation Publications Act through an amendment in 2000, which authorised changes in the format of reprinted legislation that was consistent with current drafting practice. And by then, current drafting practice was taken to include gender neutral practice. There was, however, no reference in that Act to ensuring gender-neutral language being employed as part of that drafting, drafting practice when changing, when changing reprinted legislation. So it was, as we say in that ghastly term, going forward, but not backwards in terms of the text. So this meant that the text was still expressed in the male gender though of course the interpretation was to include the female gender. This was affirmed in that new Acts Interpretation Act of 1999 that provided that the use of the masculine gender in enactments passed or made before the commencement of the Act now included females. Now I'll return to this <coughs> issue later, but I want just now to complete the narrative of the reform process within which gender neutral drafting was incorporated. So as you recall, I talked about the terms of reference given to us in the mid-80s. And part of those were to provide for a review of legislation in a systematic way. So after the productive period of the 90s, where we had changes in drafting practice and new Acts Interpretation Act, the Law Commission took a rest and became diverted into other projects. In 2008, however, it produced a new report called the Presentation of New Zealand Statute Law, which provides the basis for that legislation bill which is currently before our Parliament. Now, this new report marks the completion of what has in effect been a 25-year reform project and is primarily focused on making New Zealand statutes accessible to all in the forward, 
of the report, Sir Geoffrey Palmer, now President of the Royal Commission, acknowledges the changes already made to incorporate plain English drafting and to make legislation electronically accessible. He goes on, however, to say that the focus of this report is not the text, but on the accessibility of the statutes themselves. He summarised the recommendations in the report in, in, this, uh, in this way. He said it's first to provide an index so the law can be found. Law students will be pleased. Secondly, it's to weed out statutes that are out of date, and our statute book has many. Third, it's to provide a systematic program for revising statutes to ensure they are user-friendly. And finally, it's to rescue historical statutes from self-destruction. The Legislation Bill, then, is a fundamental, provides for a fundamental review of existing law and practices and in effect replaces much of the legislation in this area except the Acts of Interpretation Act. So what we've got is that the recommendations in the report which included a draft bill were very quickly adopted by the government and I'm sure that's why and if you are interested the bill is set out in enormous detail and the government has incorporated it into its legislative program, a little changed, but substantially the same. I'm sure it was also adopted so quickly by the government because the members of the Law Commission now include not only Sir Geoffrey, who had started the process, but Emeritus Professor John Burroughs QC, who is a noted New Zealand expert on statutory interpretation, and also on the Commission is the former Chief Parliamentary Counsel, George Tanner, QC. So I regard this as an excellent example of law reform undertaken by real experts. It's also an example of persistence being rewarded, because as I said, it's taken us nearly 25 years, and I'm not sure the project is at an end, because it does need to be constantly reviewed. I want now to turn more to the specific topic, and that is gender neutral drafting and our experience <coughs> in New Zealand. I felt, however, it was not possible to really understand the changes that have taken place there without some knowledge of the legal and social context within which they took place. So, changes to drafting practice result from changes to drafting policy, and it's this relationship between policy and gender neutral drafting that was essential in the New Zealand context. <coughs> it was the second wave of feminism in the 60s and the 70s that renewed interest in the gendered nature of legislation and the law generally. Pressure from feminists for general change in policy to include the interests of women was also reflected in the movement to ensure the text reflected this development. The discovery of the persons cases by feminists in the 1970s in New Zealand fueled us with not only a sense of injustice, but also an awareness of the barriers for the inclusion of women within the legal system generally. The role of language, however, in the social construction of gender during this time, I think has been well studied and documented elsewhere, so I'm not going to review the arguments this evening. It's appropriate, however, I think for our purposes tonight, to remind ourselves of the end purpose for adopting a gender analysis to legislation. And one of the best quotes I've found on this is from the UNESCO Guidelines to Gender Neutral Language, where it says, the whole purpose of a gender analysis is to redefine the basic assumptions of dominant cultural, social and economic structures in order to promote and secure women's basic human rights, needs and aspirations. So the importance of language in securing the equality of women can't be underestimated. Through language, we acknowledge or ignore women. Attitudes and prejudices are created and transmitted through language. 
We take language for granted often and therefore so often underestimate its effect on us. Language reflects our culture, of course, and as our culture evolves and develops through experience, so does our language. As the role of women evolve then, so does the expectation that our language reflects this development. That change process, however, is often difficult and very different for both formal and informal language. Legal language, of course, is amongst the most formal use of language because it defines rights and obligations. So it's not surprising that change came slowly to legal drafting and required clear direction and commitment from policy makers <coughs> to ensure the change of policy was also reflected in the language of the law. The relationship between the policy maker and legal drafters is a crucial one and not always well understood. It requires, I believe, an understanding of the professionalism of both parties. I had an opportunity to understand the importance of this relationship when I was appointed the Minister Responsible for the Office of Parliamentary Council, which was part of the responsibility assigned to the Attorney General, who had overall responsibility for legislation. Now, this was not normally seen as a political role that attracted much attention. However, on my watch, the office was involved in the project to convert the statute book into, into an electronic form accessible at no cost to everybody. This was a very complex and costly exercise that predictably each year ran over budget and at times presented technical issues that seemed insurmountable. Such circumstances test the commitment of any executive to the notion of bringing legislation to the people. There are no votes in it, I must say, as I was reminded by my colleagues, and the media was unsupportive because it only focused on the cost overrun. My advocacy, however, would have gone to absolutely no avail without the support of the Minister of Finance, who fortunately was also the government leader in the House of Representatives. Now, he was one of my few colleagues who understood the value of legal drafters to progressing the government's legislative program and supported increased funding that was required to see it through to a successful conclusion. So perseverance with this development in technology, I believe, has genuinely increased access of legislation to the people. This experience, however, confronted me with the reality of the work of the law drafter. A great deal is expected of these professionals, from officials and ministers who require bills overnight sometimes to fit in with the government's timetable. I was left in no doubt through this experience that the quality of the drafting, however, reflected not only the skill and professionalism of the drafter, but also the quality of the drafting instructions which in turn reflected the quality of the policy proposal. In such circumstances, reliance on tried and tested drafting techniques is essential. So it was important to make sure that the gender-neutral drafting techniques were an integral part of the drafter's toolbox. The Law Commission had, of course, been aware of the various debates in the 1980s surrounding the masculine bias of legislative text and the need to incorporate gender-neutral language in its recommendations. In its 1996 report on format and style, it directly addressed the issue of gender-neutral drafting in these terms. It said, always use gender-neutral language. Some of the more common methods of avoiding the traditional use of the male pronouns include the following. Quote, the first four approaches, it says, are adaptations of the sentence. A member of the tribunal may resign his office. The report then cites the following approaches. Omit the pronoun, use the masculine and feminine pronoun, repeat the noun, convert the noun to verb form, use a relative clause. It concludes, however, the report does in this section with this observation. 
choose techniques that communicate the message as effectively and elegantly as possible. Now this approach is consistent with that advocated by Helen Zianke, who wrote in a publication, an excellent publication, I must say, from this institution, where she said, if there's a conflict between gender-neutral language and plain language, again, the deciding factor must be clarity, precision, unambiguity, and ultimately effectiveness in legislation. It is therefore, she said, evident that the highest virtue or value pursued by the drafters around the world is effectiveness. I respectfully, respectfully agree with this approach because unless the words are clear, precise and unambiguous, legislation creates for both courts and the lay reader an unnecessary barrier to understanding and acting on the purpose and the intent of the enactment. It's interesting to note that in the 2008 Law Commission report, the last one I mentioned before, the recommendations addressed, addressed not only gender neutral text and interpretation of legislation, but also the gendered nature of language in reprinted legislation. And that legislation bill incorporates what I think is an important clause because it enables the Chief Parliamentary Council, who's charged with responsibility of going through past legislation to bring it up to date, <coughs> if you like, to make the following changes in these, amongst them these two. Language that indicates or could be taken to indicate a particular gender may be changed to a gender neutral language so that it's consistent with current drafting practice as long as it's also consistent with the purpose of the legislation being reprinted. This is in the bill. The bill then goes on to give examples of how this could be done. The bill says the word he may be changed to he or she or replaced with the relevant noun. The word chairman may be changed to chairperson. The word Her Majesty the Queen may be changed to the sovereign. So all that is actually set out in the bill in as about as unambiguous way as you possibly can to make it clear as to what can be done with the process when you reprint legislation. So I think this now addresses the long outstanding concern that while there's been a change in current drafting practice in recent years, much of the statute book still contained masculine language, but now we have a process, I think, to address that. The words then must accurately reflect the purpose of, of the legislation. This of course assumes that the policy is also clearly stated, so the drafter, through the use of drafting techniques, rules and provisions, <coughs> can translate the idea through the language into a rule. For those of us who have pursued the goal of gender neutral, or as some of us would more accurately say gender equal legal language, in both legislation and judgment, there has been a twofold challenge. First, has been to get the policy reflecting the needs and interests of women right, and then secondly, to ensure the drafting techniques convey the gendered nature of all policy. The struggle women in New Zealand for equality can of course be viewed in many ways, including through the lens of change in language and legislation. The first challenge presented to us was that the law did not obviously discriminate against women in the sense it specifically identified women as being treated differently. Apart from a few provisions in legislation such as the Factories Act that specified hours of work for women, it was difficult to actually point to discriminatory legislation. And this of course, as we now know, was because the inequality lay more deeply in the construction of the legislation in the male experience, which was expressed in the use of male language, in particular through the use of the male pronoun. And it was very difficult to get policymakers and drafters to understand that the male pronoun did not automatically include women for those of us who read it. 
Sexist language, of course, it's been argued by feminists, contributes to the marginalisation of women and to their unequal status. Initially, as feminists, we sought to remove sexist language and replace it with gender-inclusive language. And Mary Ann Bosnett, a, a noted Canadian legal academic who's written a lot on this, explains the reasons for non-discriminatory language and law as being important to promote accuracy in legal speech and in writing, also to conform to requirements of professional responsibility, and finally to satisfy equality guarantees in laws and constitution. A good summary for those of you who may be interested in the whole development of gender neutral language and legislation and drafting is summarised in two articles by Sandra Peterson, uh, and she is a New Zealander who uh, has published in the uh, Statutes um, uh, Review, uh, where she's done a survey of the development over many countries of changes in, in drafting techniques. And she noted the trend towards a policy of gender neutral drafting from the 1980s in New Zealand, Australia, Canada and the United Kingdom all adopted this approach of trying to actually change drafting techniques. The United States has only recently introduced gender neutral drafting and an update on the use of gender neutral language and practice and difficulties facing the slow implementation of it has also been reviewed in Christopher Williams. I know these articles, but there aren't any others, really. There are very few specific, as I could find anyway, analyses in any detail of the times on this. He argues, I thought quite interestingly, the difficulties with making legislation gender neutral um, enacted before the policy change to gender neutral legislation. And as I said, I think we've now addressed that in New Zealand by going back in the reprinting of it to fix up the language uh, that was gender specific. The legislation bill, I must say, uh, has also been quite interesting <coughs> because what it provides is that this is not going to be something that may or may not happen. It has to be done systematically. So the bill actually requires the Attorney General to place before the Parliament a three-year revision programme of the statute book. So we have three-year elections in New Zealand. So at the beginning of each three-year period, there will be a consultation round, and the Attorney General will set out for the Parliament what legislation is basically to be reviewed in the next three-year programme. Revision will be undertaken by the Chief Parliamentary Council in accordance with current drafting practices, and as I already noted, that means gender-neutral terms as well. The, this is going to be a major exercise. I'm not quite sure if they've really thought it through, but I hope they don't, because it seems to me the best way to systematically go through your legislative uh, book to be able to, in fact, make it truly relevant to the people who are affected by the laws. The techniques, of course, employed by drafters to reduce um, the use of sexist language, I think, are well known to all of you. The masculine rule was uh, the popular one and it was a rule of interpretation to be found in the Act dealing with rules of interpretation. In essence, it states the use of the male gender shall be deemed to include the female unless the contrary intention is expressed. This rule, of course, requires no change of language, which was one of our objections to it. Um, variations on this rule, however, were the two-way rule, where you could use either masculine or female, and that's also uh, been noted, as I said, in our legislation. Again, it didn't actually require any change in the masculine text and was merely an add-on to the masculine rule. Other techniques used to redress sexist language uh, was also was called the all-gender rule, which again meant little change uh, actually had to take place to the text. So most of the changes were about interpretation and actually about the language. So while these rules certainly were an aid to interpretation of it, they didn't address the central issue. A rule that would have required considerable change in the text was interesting rule, the separate gender rule, which expressly prevents the use of either masculine or female or words to include the other. Now, this is actually exciting and therefore would never happen because it would require a redrafting of legislation to ensure specific reference was made so the policy and the content 
when actually you have to reflect whether it was to address male or female in their experience within it. Not surprisingly, it's not used. Although the use of gender-neutral interpretation rules uh, has achieved little change in the text, the adoption, I believe, of gender-neutral drafting policies has achieved much greater extent. So you've got, if you like, the formality of it, but the actual work of the drafters, at least in the New Zealand context, have really taken on board what was required so you see through the legislation that, in fact, a genuine issue <coughs> has been made to try and provide uh, gender-neutral drafting. Now, I know that drafters have to be conscious of the costs uh, that are involved in any change in drafting style, and therefore it's important, however, that those sorts of considerations do not stifle any innovation take place. And as Daniel Greenberg, uh, one of the other few texts I found on gender neutral drafting, has said, ideally drafters can approach a new requirement to draft a gender neutral style in a more positive spirit than seeing its implementation only as an exercise in damage control. Anything that causes us to overhaul our drafting and that challenges our ingrained habits, is capable of being seen as an opportunity for rejuvenation and improvement. And I can only partly agree with his comments. He then goes on and sets out uh, techniques and practices with which you are familiar of repetition, emission, reorganisation, return to programs, etc. So I won't go through those as he goes through the, the various if you like, technical ways in which you can get a plain English style into your drafting. The techniques and practices demonstrate, I think, in many ways uh, that we have, at least in the New Zealand context, achieved gender neutrality when it comes to drafting. And although the policy maker may give the direction for gender neutral text, it is the drafter who must have the responsibility of doing it. So I have enormous respect for our drafters in New Zealand because they have. <coughs> Although I must say that, that uh, while my comments so far have been for domestic legislation, there has been a bit of interest also in international instruments to ensure they are also uh, drafted in a gender neutral way and the United Nations has attempted to do some gender neutral drafting, again that period being marked from the end of the 1980s. I was also recently asked to give advice on gender neutrality on the drafting of the ILO constitution, which was an opportunity to look to see uh, some of the difficulties that certainly there may well be there in terms of getting a text when you've got several languages and you've got uh, quite a lot of difference to get that accommodation of agreement. But at the end of the day, my fundamental point, I suppose, is if you get your policy right, then the words will follow, whether it be in the domestic or it be in the international context. So in the New Zealand context, again, while we may well have done much to eliminate the use of sexist language. It's not sufficient in itself, I believe, because gender equal legislation is more than just that issue of language. It's an issue of policy. So in New Zealand there's been attempts consistently made from that period in, in the mid-80s to try and ensure there is gender inclusiveness in policy as well as drafting rules, practices and techniques. And the first step we took towards that gender inclusive policy was the establishment of a Ministry of Women's Affairs in 1986. It was part of a Labour Women's strategy to give women a voice within the public service advice that was given to ministers. All the story of the uh, formation of the ministry and its struggle to survive various public sector reforms is beyond the breath of the lecture. What is relevant is that the ministry developed guidelines for gender analysis 
that in the words of the then National Government Minister of Women's Affairs, offers a new tool in understanding and developing policies and services that promote gender equity. So the guidelines were set out in a framework for all policy to be subjected to this analysis during its development. Well, unsurprisingly, it wasn't done by everybody. So in 2002, the then Labour-led government approved a cabinet circular that required the inclusion of gender implication statements in all submissions to its cabinet social equity committee. And the circular was issued because the cabinet noted its concern that the quality of state statements today has been varied. It's kind of them. Mainly because gender analysis has not been applied, and this is the important point, at the problem definition stage of policy development. This limits, the cabinet uh, circular said, the usefulness and quality of analysis and reduces the probability of successful policy outcomes for all population groups. So this was a clear direction. Of, we've got the analysis, we've got the direction from the cabinet to public officials to use it. We also had an important innovation in the Legislation Advisory Committee, again established in 1986, a busy year 1986, and it was part of a review of legislative form and practice but it also, importantly, provides advice to public officials on how to go about the preparation of legislation. So the Cabinet Guide at the moment, prepared by the Cabinet Office, advises officials on the preparation of papers and includes not only the 2002 circular but also the Legislative Advisory Committee instructions. So I think overall it must be acknowledged that serious attempts have been made, in the New Zealand context anyway, to embed gender neutral practices in the preparation and delivery of advice to the executive. And although directions are in place, of course the effectiveness will depend on a political commitment to apply. It's not an easy process, especially at a time of devising policies to address economic failure of previous policies. I would argue, however, that unless such a policy analysis is <coughs> undertaken seriously, there is a likelihood that the inequalities of the past will be reinvented in the new policy framework. Still, I guess that's for another lecture. So in conclusion, it must be stated that while the efforts of legal drafters to incorporate gender-neutral practices and techniques in legislative texts are to be commended, the real barrier to gender equality lies with the policy makers in both the executive and the public service. In the New Zealand context, the efforts of women and men who have pursued gender equality and through legal equality over the past 40 years have produced many changes. There is a greater awareness of the importance of gender equal policy making and the expression of these policies in gender neutral statutory text. The legislation bill that is currently for our parliament is a good example that progress that's been made. However, the struggle is far from over and is ongoing, and the women of my generation can only hope it will be continued by the women of the next. But in conclusion, as Sir William Dale so appropriately quoted in his autobiography the following, which I thought was just so apt. Time present and time past are both perhaps present and time future, and time future contained in time past. T.S. Eliot. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor, Professor Wilson. That was again a model of plain speaking. Uh, no ambiguity there. I think we can, we can all agree. I, I, I'm very impressed indeed by the, the efforts made in New Zealand to make its laws accessible and readable. Um, I was, of course, concerned when she said that it has taken 25 years to get where they are. And my little project, I'm not sure I've got 25 years left to, to see it through. Um, Professor Wilson has kindly agreed to, to take questions. Um, but there's a wealth of material for you to, to focus on, so let's throw open the floor to questions. Yes. Margaret, I wonder if you could say anything about the reaction of the New Zealand courts 
to the legislative change, changes in particular to gender neutral language. <coughs> Specifically, have any of the courts criticised um, gender neutral language as creating an ambiguity or a complexity that wasn't there? And if, as I suspect they haven't, isn't that a case for introduction of gender neutral language? No, I, I was struggling to, to think of any negative comments at all, actually. The debate was mainly around aids to interpretation, and that wasn't really about gender neutrality. It was more about what um, analysis you used and what documents you used and to get the purpose of the legislation. So it's clear that you don't just look at the words any longer, but then the question is, what else do you look at? So I think from, from the court's um, perspective, the, that really, um, once we got the policy right from the beginning of the 80s, I think, mid-80s onwards, the courts <coughs> by and large interpreted in the way it should be. I must say that that's partially because they don't interpret it very much because we create separate institutions to pursue legal remedies through human rights bodies and things like that. But no, they have been it. There's been a lot of work inside the judiciary as well, Helen, during that period. I, I remember addressing a judge's conference on gender neutrality and gender equality and, and what it meant around the same time. Derek Robert, I'm a um, research um, associate fellow here. Um, you mentioned the uh, conflict that could arise between clarity of position and gender equal language, and it really can't be argued that uh, precision clarity must prevail, although I think I could argue it's a false antithesis. Um, um, but uh, do you know of any actual example where um, gender equal, equal languages have to give way to precision. No. I can't think of the New Zealand context. Either. I, I can't think of No. I, 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 we could take them on, could we? could challenge anyone to produce them. But it's, it's, I think <coughs> the whole argument was, was it's not, it was more than a perception, it was <coughs> the importance of language. Mm -hmm. And if you just keep on seeing one gender, then you obviously think it is, but it's quite easy to change that. And once you change it, then it does make a remarkable difference. Yeah, I do have two questions. <laughs> um, firstly, I'm, my name is Vanessa, I'm a student in the concept. Firstly, um, do you think that legislative drafting as a technique is enough to rid our system of deep-seated, um, patriarchal, sexist views as judges are still given room to interpret, and hence that is where the damage is done. Do you think gender usual I know it's a start, but um, do you think as a, as a technique it is enough to rid our system of um, the problems that feminists have faced over the centuries of the patriarchal views of society? And that is my first question. The answer is not enough, and that's why for me it's always been the relationship between the draft and, and Policy. And then I suppose you could also say the implementation of that policy, whether it be through interpretation and allocation of resources. So you have to have both, otherwise it doesn't really work. And another easy problem that I have is that gender neutral drafting as a technique sometimes can extinguish the, um, the, the victim, the, the um, problems that the victims face because um, some crimes are gender specific like domestic violence, for example, and when you neutralize the language, um, it, it takes away the, the fact that um, you know, it's women who are predominantly um, at risk of this sort of um, perpetrated violence. And sometimes you know, you're gendering an, an, an act, but it does take away the, um, the specifics that the act should be in that, for example, that's a, a female crime, and then it takes the focus off of women. So what is the point? That's correct. Well, I think that there are specific um, instances where you can, they are probably quite few though, because even with violence, unfortunately it's not confined to one gender. Um, it might predominantly be with one, but not only. 
So I think in, in terms, that's when you come back to, well, what is the clarity and effectiveness that you want from this legislation? And it is that violence is a crime. Now, if you want to, to use your legislation as advocacy, then I do think you get yourself into some trouble, to be honest. I think that can be done elsewhere. If you had some difficulties in terms of ensuring that the way in which was interpreted, then you have to find the language that would ensure the courts will do that, or find the judges who will do it, which is probably easier, um, in some ways, in terms of the appointments processes. But, but you can't, I personally don't think you can um, use it in, in, it has to be neutral, and if you're going to have it equal, as I'd argue there, then you have to entirely frame separate legislation for that particular experience. And we're nowhere near doing that properly, I'm afraid. Violence is a good one. Hey, Roland Cormigan, uh, also a student here. Can I ask a little bit more about the conflict that there can be sometimes between plain language and gender neutral language? And um, one of the definitions you gave of plain language was to use ordinary language. Uh, what do you think we should do when the ordinary language is sexist itself? And I'm just thinking some specific examples. If you say bin man, everyone knows what that is, but it's, it's a sexist term. Uh, but if you were to say refuse traction technician, that's not exactly like very plain. Or if you say postman, if you say postal worker. In those cases of conflict, what do you think we should do? Should we, should we embrace the gender neutral language and accept that it might be a little bit obscure and give some time for, for society to catch up with the uh, gender neutral language? I always go for the gender neutral language. Mm -hmm. as, as long as, I mean, you can find the words that will actually be able to, to express it. You might be slightly to hear what people say. People will talk anyway. We're talking now about formal language not in formal language. So if you're talking about formal language and the importance of that and, and the messages it sends out, then no. And it's really hard to, to <coughs> you can't find words to, to be able to describe the activity. Mm. Yeah. You have a lot of fun with it too, of course. You have a lot of criticism, but, but it's interesting how it has actually changed. Um, perhaps that's a quint. Um, I, I was... Um, I'm a member of the Statute of Law Society and I knew Sir William very well uh, when I was on the council mm -hmm. with him. Um, and one of the things <coughs> he and I had in common was our interest in plain language. Um, I'm a barrister and I specialise in uh, charities and I'm able to draft uh, documents which uh, have to be Exclude one sex, um, even even by appearance. Um, what I'm uh, interested in asking you is about the word the use of the word they instead of he or she. I, one can see it; it's convenient because he or she is a bit of a is, is a bit of a mouth. Um, but they or their uh, offends me <laughs> as, a, as a classicist. Because people are using the wrong uh, uh, number. And I just wonder what, what your view of that is. Well, I, I think it's probably a bit like yours, really, in a way that, that um, because we don't use it like that, and it seems a false construction. And I, I think, therefore, um, rather than, for me anyway, and there's hard and fast rules you must always do that. So you try to get the sense of so you get the clarity of it. And you try to make this to the best of the best you can, and avoid data. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I'm going to go in that direction. But sometimes it may be appropriate. Sometimes just a question of reconstruction, the the uh, lay, the uh, sentence itself, or, or whatever. Or using the noun, or putting it in the plural. Yeah, or using the plural. Hi, I'm Mark. <coughs> Margarita Renville. Um, do you ever use the abbreviation S stroke H E? I think it's been an evolution. It used to be quite common. Yes, that's right. And, and I think um, that's what the, the wonder and the beauty of language is it does actually evolve and change. And I'm not sure I guess I'm not um, But personally not, but we did use it. Yes, 
but I haven't seen it for a while. Ah, in this country, the offence of rape can only be committed by a man. That's the Actus Reis, that's the Draft of the Central Offences Act of 2003. There is, of course, a similar offence for women as a sexual um, assault, I think. It, it seems, in that instance here, there's no scope for actually putting a neutral. It's just he, if a, if a man commits this offence, he will well, be guilty. I'm just wondering how it would be in New Zealand. I mean, we we don't use the word rape. Right. Really? That's what we're doing. <laughs> so you make, you make the offence, the, the violation, which of course um, it, um, it it just uh, removed that that connotation. I'm trying to think. I think what the sexual violation was. I'm sure we did this in the eighties. Great great time in the eighties. This sort of thing. Terrible for free market policies, but, but really good for social legislation in New Zealand. So, um, and this did come up, and of course there there is um, the offence of uh, rape when um, men do rape other men. Uh, there are um, offences where women have assisted with rape, and there are some who think, well, some activity is it's not actually the word or even the physicality of it in some ways. It's actually the violation. But that's really what you're getting at in terms of trying to punish that sort of offence with that violation of another person. So we had a long, long debate in our caucus on whether, in fact, one should do away with the murder rate because of their very strong connotations of, of um, this was an extraordinary serious offence, but in the end, yeah. Margaret, um, just wondering, um, what do you think the increase in representation of women in Parliament under Henry Payne has been one of those key drivers, and, and I think the associated increase in representation of women in the institutions that um, that interpret the legislation you think needs to be in right to the line? Absolutely essential. Don't have any questions about that. And it's the maintenance of it to keep, to keep because it's, it doesn't stop in a way because language evolves and changes as does human experience and behaviour. So it's to make sure it's inclusive of both male and female behaviours as far as the law is concerned. Now, in, in uh, New Zealand now, we've got about 34% of our members of parliament are women and about a third of them are as well. So there is, I uh, wouldn't say they're all feminists by any means, but there is a consciousness of different experience. That the, um, I think it's, it's, a, it's a lot easier sometimes. I think you said at the beginning one of the aims of the um, legislative change was to increase accessibility. Mm -hmm. I guess by that you mean both accessibility of the language and of the statute mm -hmm. itself. So, I was wondering, has, has any research been done on whether any one of them, the kind of usual suspects, lawyers, and academics, actually access it? Actually, do access it. It's a very good question. Yeah. I don't know any, but, but I do. I do know from people who bring me up who have access to <laughs> wanting to know what it means. <laughs> so, um, but it would be a really useful research to do actually, where people do find what the law is or not. Um, but no, I don't know. I mean, research is good project, so. Actually, the, probably the most significant thing makes that sort of related to that, but I think the new legislation bill, which has cross party support, so we'll go through it, um, is, is that people have more difficulty finding what is the relevant piece of legislation. So it's not always named appropriately. <coughs> um, and I think that's going to be quite an interesting project to see where that goes to. So it's not only about it, Accessibility is uh, knowing where the legislation is that, that relates to your particular issue. One last question. Um, do you think um, sexism is a, is a social problem that needs a social solution and not a legal drafting solution? Oh, well, the law reflect, reflects what I think social. So you can't have one without the other. Um, so you need a, you probably need a social change. We need a social change. Um, first 
often change hearts and minds anyway, but if you can change behaviours, that's a really good start. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Wilson. Thank you, Anne. And we see the number of questions as uh, an indication of the interest that your talk uh, is around. And I'm sure that people will come up to you when we break for drinks in just a moment to uh, put more questions to you. So, uh, but before I let you uh, attack the drinks, I've been asked to mention um, the forthcoming lecture on the 31st of January, Paul Regan who is Olympic and Paralymp of the Olympic and Paralympic Security Directorate, the Office for Security and Counterterrorism at the Home Office, will talk about enacting legislation, a civil servant's perspective. That's the 31st of January at 6 o'clock here. Yeah, everyone's welcome. And just advance notice of the 11th Sir William Dale Memorial Lecture. We're organising it at the moment, but it should be in October or November this year, and we hope that it will be given by Eleanor Sharps, <coughs> who you may know is the Advocate General at the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg. So her talk, I hope, will be something about the quality of European legislation. So I hope that I'll see you all again then. Um, so just a moment for me to thank Professor Wilson on your behalf um, and to invite you to start on the drinks. <laughs>